Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Load Research Chapters webinar on data-based energy performance certificates in South Africa. Before we start, a few webinar considerations. Attendees are reminded to ensure the volume is turned up on their device. Ensure you have a stable internet connection. This will ensure the streaming and audio will run smoothly. Attendees can ask questions via the questions panel located within the GoToWebinar control panel. By default, the control panel is located on the right-hand side of your screen. The chat function is reserved for webinar organizers and panelists to communicate with attendees. Attendees will not be able to chat with each other, however, are encouraged to ask questions. A recording of this webinar will be made available on the SIE YouTube channel, SIEE TV, under the Load Research Chapter playlist. This channel is updated regularly, so ensure you check back as often as possible for new uploads. Please click on the link that will appear in the chat box shortly to subscribe to our TV channel. It's free. A certificate of attendance will be issued a few weeks after this webinar, once we have received the CPD validation number from EXA. I'd like to now introduce you to our host tonight, Mr. Marcus Dekana, who is the Vice Chairman of the SRE Load Research Chapter. Marcus began his career at the Electricity Department, City of Cape Town. He was drawn into CSIR as a research engineer involved in energy management and HV testing projects. This led to the discovery of electrical load research, a passion that has lasted at least 25 years with partnerships in ESCOM, municipalities, academia, and consulting. Marcus has led SA long-term load research projects to categorize domestic load behavior and industrial consumer load behavior the results of which have been implemented into planning standards and guidelines. He has conducted research in South Africa, Namibia, Lesotho, and collaborated regionally. Over to you, Marcus. Thank you, Minx. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good evening to you. And I uh, welcome to you to this uh, webinar of the Load Research chapter. Um, I am the, uh, the chair of the, of the Load Research chapter. And um, it is my job to, to introduce Barry, a man who needs no introduction, but I, I will do that anyway. Barry is the, the general manager of energy efficiency and data knowledge management at the South African National Energy Development Institute, that is SENEDI. Barry's been working in the energy industry since 1983, uh, first for ESCOM for 27 years and subsequently at the South African uh, at SENEDI which is a state-owned entity within the Department of Mineral Energy, Mineral Resources and Energy. For those of you who um, feel that the, uh, you know, you ask what has Barry done, uh, if you think about the path that South Africa has followed with incandescent um, lighting through to CFL lighting and now moving more lately to, um, to LED lighting, this was all under the, the custodianship of uh, Barry and, and his colleagues. So um, there's substantial work going on at Senedi, and uh, I hope um, in the early part of this uh, presentation, Barry will give us an idea of uh, what is going on at Senedi, and then we'll take us through the data-driven energy certificate um, part of the talk. Okay, colleagues, without further ado, I will hand over to Barry uh, to take us through his presentation. Thank you, Barry. Thank you very much, uh, Marcus and Minx. I, uh, and to everyone else who are attending this webinar after hours, I uh, uh, really appreciate this opportunity. It is indeed an honor for me to be able to, to talk to you tonight. Um, I am Hopefully going to be able to share some insights, as Marcus said, around energy performance certificates, but also uh, around uh, you know, some of the work that Zanetti is doing and how energy performance certificates links into a lot of the other areas that might be of interest to this audience um, and to the Institute in general. So once again, thanks, thanks for the opportunity. And, and I'm talking tonight specifically about data-based energy performance certificates. So, the concept is around energy performance certificates, uh, but the, 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 
the, the interest for the specific chapter is around the data and, and, and what can be done with this data going forward. So just by way of introduction, Sinedi, as Marcus introduced us, is the abbreviation for the South African National Energy Development Institute. Uh, we were established in uh, 2008 through the National Energy Act. Um, and we have two core mandates. The one is research and development and just recently added innovation. And the second mandate is specifically uh, around the implementation of energy efficiency throughout the economy. Uh, the work on energy performance certificates is, is a combination of the two. It involves quite a bit of research uh, has taken place to get to the point where we are now. It will feed back into research, but the actual con uh, the, the, the focus is uh, to improve energy efficiency in the, in, in the economy. So energy performance certificates, uh, just to give you an indication, the legislation, it is a legislated uh, initiative that is taking place in South Africa, long in the making. It's uh, quite a bit of work went into developing uh, the necessary uh, sort of policy landscape to introduce this at a time when, when, when things are fairly difficult and the economy is, is in a bit of dire straits. Uh, but I'll go through exactly that. I'll talk about the reasons why energy performance certificates have been introduced at this particular stage. How does it fit in with the with the national energy efficiency strategy, which is a strategy for South Africa across all market sectors? We'll talk a bit about the label, and that's where the data component comes in, and then uh, the implementation of EPCs um, in South Africa. In the bottom right hand corner, you'll actually see an example of what a typical EPC certificate looks like uh, that will be displayed in buildings uh, in their reception, mandatory to display, to display this uh, in their reception areas. And I'm sure most of the audience will be familiar with this label. Uh, it is the same label, uh, the same rating scale we use for, for appliances in South Africa. So if you go into most uh, retailers, you'll see refrigerators, stoves, uh, even uh, geysers, um, and, and uh, a range of other appliances. You will see a similar uh, sticker on the front door, and it will give you an indication of the performance of that particular appliance. Same applying to the building where A is um, a very efficient building, uh, G being a very inefficient building, and then uh, a bit of supporting doc, uh, information around that is included in the certificate. And we'll go into that in a bit more detail just now. So you know, how does EPCs relate to energy UCC buildings? Uh, very simplistically, um, and uh, you know, sometimes it comes across as being very simplistic, but when you get into the detail, you can see that it is a lot more involved. But ultimately, what we're trying to do is to get to a similar indicator like we that we use when we buy a car. We look at how many uh, kilometers per liter can the car get, and that tells us how um, efficient is that vehicle. Uh, some of us prefer to go for the higher consumption and the energy guzzlers if we can afford it. But the majority of people look at energy consumption amongst a range of other indicators. And ultimately, an EPC is oh, the same. It's just looking at your kilowatt hours, your energy consumption, uh, per square meter for that building over a period of time. So same as filling up your car, you're now filling up your building with, with energy. Um, the, the energy uh, certificate uh, development timeline uh, is, is, is incredible. And this just gives you an, an idea of, in South Africa, the process and the bureaucracy and you know, the time it takes to get legislation passed um, is 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 really it's beyond beyond comprehension because the the first talk about introducing energy uh, performance certificates started in the period 2000 to 2010 it was included in the white paper on energy um, there was various uh, discussions about looking at how do we in, uh, in increase uh, uh, energy efficiency, bearing in mind in that period, we still had fairly cheap electricity, we still had uh, surplus generating capacity, and we weren't in the situation we are now, but, but there was some foresight, and you saw the introduction in that period of time of the first energy efficiency component to the building regulations in South Africa, 
uh, commonly referred to as SANS 204, which forms part of SANS 10400XA, which is the National Building Regulations. I think some of you will be familiar. Uh, the first revision of SANS 10400XA, the building regulations, is now out for public comment. And uh, if you look at what is in included in the current uh, um, building regulations, you'll see a lot more stringent targets being set uh, and minimum performance requirements in the current in in, in the revised building regulations. The, the the original one was was built and, and developed on very little data, and this, and this emphasizes the importance of data. Um, there was hardly any data around at that time, uh, so there was uh, a tendency to look at international best practices. And in this case, we used Australia as as the benchmark, and we modelled a lot of the work into the original 10400 based on the Australian energy performance and, and energy consumption, um, because the climatic conditions and, and various other conditions are pretty similar to South Africa. So. In, in that particular work, uh, the, the need for labeling was identified. And now we're talking about 2021, this regulation to make energy performance certificates mandatory in certain classes of buildings uh, only happened on the 8th of December, 2020. So uh, I'm not gonna go through each of the different uh, components, but just to give you an indication that it's a 10 year process to get a pretty simple, uh, regulation approved, um, but bearing in mind behind that regulation, you need to do a lot of research uh, to get to the point of actually promulgating the regulation, going through public uh, comment phases twice in this particular case, um, and also looking specifically at um, things like uh, pilot projects, looking at uh, literature reviews and, and the necessary things that go with it. But what's more fundamentally important is the underlying South African Bureau of Standard standard to, uh, to regulate the actual regulations themselves. So that standard um, for EPC specifically is SANS 1544, and that happened uh, in the period 2014. So we had an approved standard for EPCs for buildings already in 2014, but the regulation only followed uh, a good six years later. So why the sudden focus on, on EPC? So as I said, this was included in the South African National Energy Efficiency Strategy. We saw the first strategy in the, in the early years. We've seen the latest version of the National Energy Efficiency Strategies, what is commonly referred to as the post-2015 National Energy Efficiency Strategy. So it's using 2015 as the baseline and uh, setting targets for different sectors of the market in terms of energy improvement by 2030. Another uh, reason was, you know, the uh, international trends. Uh, South Africa is one of the few countries that did not have energy performance certificates uh, regulated. Uh, most countries, developed and developing countries, do have a form of energy performance certification for buildings. Uh, and this is outside of what you talk when we refer to green building um, star rating awards. Because that's, that's, that's a star rating. It's not an actual performance certificate. Um, the, the regulations were signed uh, into law by Minister Gwedi Mantash on the 8th of December, and, and uh, the current regulations are enforced for a two-year period, and the sunset clause is the 7th of December 2022 for this first phase of the regulations. Um, uh, if we, if we uh, look at the, 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 the reasoning behind this, we all know that, and, and I'm talking, preaching to the converter here now. Uh, uh, the basic principle applies: if you can't manage, uh, uh, you know, if you can't manage your your consumption, you're not going to be able to make informed decisions. You're not going to be able to do the right things and to employ the necessary uh, um, skills to help you improve your energy efficiency. Um, we the regulations themselves, um, as I said, are from A to G. Uh, with D being the benchmark. So D, if your building is rated at a D, that is you are compliant with the building regulate the current building regulations, not the ones that have been uh, published now for public comment. 
So D is the benchmark. Anything above D, you're doing something well. You can then state that your building is relatively energy efficient. If you get an A rating, then you are very efficient. But anything below a D ultimately means that your building is not complying with the building regulations and the building can be condemned. Uh, highly unlikely at this stage that a building control officer will come and condemn your building based on the fact that your energy consumption is lower than a D. But uh, theoretically, uh, if you look at the scale and you were below D, you would not be compliant with the building regulations. The regulations for EPCs are applicable in this case to public and private sectors. So it's not just one of those things that are I shall do. It is we will do it together with you. And the, the, the threshold for public sector buildings is any building in the categories or the classes that I'll show you in the next slide uh, above 1,000 square meters. So very small buildings under 1,000 square meters do not have to comply at this stage. Private sector buildings only have to be bigger than 2,000 square meters. So it's a bit more lenient for, for the private sector at this stage. So that basically eliminates your residential buildings or or, or, or smaller type operations. The building types that are included in phase one are entertainment and public assembly buildings, places of instruction and, and offices are, are, are included at this stage. Um, if you take uh, Europe, for example, most European countries in the European Union, they uh, have already gone as far, and they've been doing EPC since 1990, for example, Portugal. They are already down to mandatory EPCs for residential buildings. So before you can buy or sell a house, you have to uh, provide an EPC showing the prospective buyer what the energy consumption will be going forward. Uh, similar to what we require in South Africa as a certificate of compliance around your electrical wiring. Uh, in European countries, you need uh, an EPC to sell a, sell a property. And as I said, that is right down to residential. But they also started with certain categories and evolved over time. So we've got a long way to go. So where does it come from? Um, this is just an extract of the post-2015 National Energy Efficiency Strategy. Um, you'll see it's got uh, various categories and sectors and targets, different targets uh, of energy efficiency to be met uh, by 2030 based on 2015 baseline. And they are separate categories for public buildings as well as commercial buildings. Public buildings, uh, the target is 50% savings uh, by 2030. Uh, commercial buildings or private sector buildings, 37%. And the, um, the tools or the examples of actions that would be needed to take into introduce or to reach these targets, uh, the enabling environment that government would set is uh, referred to, they're referring to standards, policies, and energy performance certificates uh, as a means to an end in this particular case. Another reason is uh, buildings, uh, people, uh, you know, don't often realize that uh, your, your, your energy and your life cycle costs in a building are, are critical. So uh, from this research, you will see that uh, for the first six to eight years, the planning and construction takes up a large percentage of the cost, 25% of the overall life cycle costing of the building. But as the building gets older, and it goes without saying, as the building gets older, so the technologies in that building become older, they become worn out, they need maintenance, and don't necessarily get maintained properly. So the energy consumption increases over the life cycle of the building and uh, the maintenance costs also in increase. So with the energy uh, performance decreasing due to, let's say, lack of maintenance or just aging technology, together with the maintenance costs, you're looking at over the life cycle that uh, this makes up around about 60% of the total cost of a building. So uh, the, there's an incentive or there's a, there's, there's a need to look at the energy performance to try and cut down that pie of 35% um, energy cost of the life cycle of the building. So let's get to the regulation specifically. As I said, uh, you'll see Mr. the Honorable Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy uh, signed into law uh, the, the regulations for energy performance certificates. Um, it was signed uh, already, and this is, uh, you know, <laughs> not, a, not, 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 not a good um, example to show that the minister signed the regulations, if you look at his signature, on the 13th of January 2020. Uh, the Gazette was published and approved 
on the 8th of December 2020. So it took a full year from his desk to reach the, the, the actual Gazette. And okay, last year was an unusual year. We had COVID and we had you know, people evacuating offices and not being in the office. That did complicate matters, but, but it gives you an undertaking or an understanding of, of once again, the bureaucracy and the time uh, that it takes to get these things in place, that these things don't happen uh, overnight. The standard, as I mentioned, underlying this is SANS 1544, approved in 2014 already, uh, very detailed standard. And this standard is aligned to 10400XA, the building regulation that was drafted on that, and the, the cross-referencing normative references are to the 10400XA. So you cannot work with the EPC regulation or standard without uh, referencing the 10400XA. Which, which makes it difficult in the fact that um, 10400XA will now change uh, drastically, as I mentioned up front, uh, which is going to require a drastic uh, revision of the EPC standard. We'll talk a bit more about that a little bit later. Um, the standards that, uh, the, the classes of buildings, I've already mentioned that to you, uh, uh, that, 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 are, that require an EPC for which it is mandatory, is um, occupancy classes, entertainment and public assembly, theatrical and indoor sport, places of instruction, which includes all schools and universities and offices. Um, this was uh, um, conceptualized and included these classes of buildings as the first phase of uh, EPCs, long before COVID uh, was even uh, you know, thought about or, or, or a, a, a possible or distant reality. So uh, what you are finding now, you know, entertainment and public assembly places, pretty much zero occupancy. Theatrical and indoor sport, pretty much zero occupancy. Uh, places of instruction on and off and offices, uh, a lot of people are working from home. So, so it does, does sort of uh, change the, the playing field a bit, uh, bearing in mind the occupancy and it, it does play a role in calculating the energy performance certificate. Um, Another important thing when it comes to energy performance certificates, uh, it is only required for buildings in these classes of occupancy classes that are two years or older. So um, brand new buildings do not require that. Yeah, the, the reasoning behind that is that you need the building to settle in, you need the technologies to be tested and everything to, to start functioning fully before you start really yeah, mapping the energy consumption. Uh, it also says uh, any buildings that have not had a, had a major renovation or change of occupancy within two years, um, the preceding two years uh, of the data that you use to, to measure the energy performance. Um, once again, providing a challenge because um, occupancy has changed significantly uh, within the last year, from 28th of March last year when uh, COVID, um, when, when, we, when we experienced COVID. So uh, that, 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 that is where we're sitting right now um, with, the, with, with the EPC, regulation linked to the standard, linked to the building standard. So, okay, we've, we've covered the classes of, of buildings. Um, the basis of SANS 1544 is um, the energy performance um, uh, measured in kilowatt hours per square meters per annum, as, as mentioned up front, of the net floor area. So there's certain exclusions, we won't go into the exclusions. So, if you've got a building with parking basements, that gets excluded because that uh, distorts your, your, your actual energy performance. That's not doing constructive work in the building. So uh, car areas, external areas, um, uh, garages, and so on are excluded. So it's the annual net floor area that uh, gets used in this calculation. Um, when you're doing the calculation, uh, you have to take into consideration all energy carriers, not only electricity. So uh, we've seen the advent of uh, a lot of diesel generation uh, coming into the fore <laughs> due to load shedding. Uh, that needs to be taken into consideration. We've seen small scale embedded generation taking uh, you know, its rightful place in the market. Uh, you need to take that into consideration. So you have to look at all energy carriers, not only the main incoming electricity supply. You need to use one year's energy consumption to determine the EPC. So you can't just choose one particular month, a good month, a summer month, or a winter month, and 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 try and uh, recall uh, and, and uh, calculate your EPC around that. You have to look at a full year period, and uh, the regulation allows for you to use recorded data or energy bills, 
or if you want to put in sub-metering into specific uh, logging of certain um, um, energy carriers, that, that is also allowed. The EPSC itself is valid for five years. So um, buildings that are newer than two years, not, not eligible, but once you've got the EPC, it is valid for five years. So what it's basically saying is every five years, you should try and aim to improve your rating. So whether you've got a, a, a D or a B rating, um, that is just the visualization of your energy consumption. Most uh, facility managers, building owners, when you start talking about kilowatt hours, uh, um, they don't really know what you're talking about. Show them a picture with an ATG rating and say, you know, you, you, A is good and G is bad. Anyone can understand that. You know, it's, it's very, very simple. We're visualizing your energy consumption. What we see in the energy efficiency, you know, when you go and try and talk to building owners and say, you know, you should be upgrading your energy, uh, you should be becoming more energy efficient. They all say, no, no, our buildings are efficient. You know, we changed the lights to LEDs uh, a few years ago, or we, you know, we've got a maintenance regime for our HVAC or, or, and various things. But then you say, how efficient is it? Um, then you get that blank look. Um, you know, compared to what are you efficient? You get the blank look. Uh, they maybe tell you, oh, well, our, our, we've reduced our bill by 5% or 6% or 7% over the last year. But compared to your um, your your competitor in the same type of building, uh, how are you doing? And this this actually allows you to do that benchmark and to compare yourself um, with your peers. Um, yeah, and, and when you take a, let's say, a property group, one of the big property groups, don't want to use names here, but, uh, but one of the big property developers that's got multiple buildings, they want to check how the different buildings are comparing against each other. They want to lease the building or they want to rent a space in the building. Um, people want to know, but am I going to be, um, you know, what, what are my, my utility cost going to be, they can show them, you, we, this building is an A-rated building, so your, your running costs for the building will, will be uh, restricted. So, um, you know, just to ensure that uh, everything is transparent and also that uh, there is, is quality control in the whole process, um, the regulations do require that the EPC has to be assessed and issued by a SUNAS accredited uh, inspection body. So SUNAS is basically just ensuring that uh, the person who's doing the assessment is competent, uh, they're accredited in terms of certain ISO uh, um, standards, and that these people have got the necessary qualifications to be able to do the work. They are independent, they're third party, it's not you doing your self-assessment, it gives you some sort of credibility and independence um, and, and transparency around that. Um, the, the, the SUNAS uh, accredited body uh, gets audited themselves on an annual basis by SUNAS uh, to make sure that everything is placed. And there they look at, you know, things like um, your, 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 your technologies, your metering, uh, have you got calibration certificates, is everything up to standard to, to just ensure that everything's above board. The process itself is fairly simple uh, to get an EPC. It's, it's, it's pretty straightforward. I, I won't go through each of the blocks, but ultimately the customer has been given marching orders in those four classes of buildings by uh, the regulation. He or she would need to contact the SUNAS accredited inspection body to actually go and do this work for them and to get their buildings rated. Uh, that, that's a contractual arrangement between the building owner and the SUNAS accredited inspection body. The SUNAS uh, uh, accredited inspection body will do the assessment, get all the information, submit all the information, all the data, looking at square meterage, looking at energy consumption, looking at all, all the things. And we'll talk, I'll give you, show you some of the types of data that is required in, in the following slide. They then submit that to Sunedi. Uh, we, as the South African National Energy Development Institute, are mandated in terms of the regulations to, uh, to host a register, building energy performance certificate register for the country, where all this data will be will be kept. Uh, certain uh, bits of information will be shared. So the front end in terms of who has got what rating will be shared. It will be a public, uh, it is public for people to go and see if you want to compare yourself to someone else. Uh, you want to just see how people are, are progressing. You'll be able to see which building has got what rating. All the data behind that will be protected through prepare and, 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 and confidentiality. 
Um, what this also provides is a, a dashboard for energy service companies to go, you know, at any given day, look at all the buildings that are D or below and say, well, those are the ones that we have to go and target to go and speak to them about what we can do to help them to improve their energy efficiency, what can be um, done in terms of the, uh, the specific technologies are identified that are not performing well, um, that we can do targeted interventions to improve their energy performance. So that data will all sit with, with Cinedi. Uh, the, the information is used and uh, we need and we, we, we need to still come to grips with uh, all the uses of this particular data, but it's basically to inform policy uh, going forward when it comes to, to building specifically. So we'll do uh, modeling of the data and, and crunching the numbers uh, on a regular basis and providing feedback to, to energy planning at the department and other stakeholders. The, the inspection body themselves issue the EPC to the applicant um, and hence the need for sunless accreditation to make sure that all the checks and balances are in place. Uh, then within three months after that, the, the, the client's accounting officer needs to submit a, a certified copy of the certificate to, to Cineri, just that we can compare that with the data and to see that, um, that uh, the, the data that was submitted originally and the certificate match. Um, and, and then basically that is, is valid then for the next five years. Uh, the regulation allows for the Department of Mineral Resources and Energy to, at any given time, uh, to do random spot checks and compliance audits. And they will be doing it. So we, we, we've got a couple of EPCs, uh, um, only a few at this stage, but the DMR are already uh, putting out a tender to get someone to go and assist to do compliance audits on those couple so that if we're doing something wrong, we can learn and improve that before we get into the hundreds of certificates or thousands of certificates. And then basically there's just reminders sent out to the client, uh, you know, three years before, uh, well, after three years, so it's two years before it expires, and then one year before it expires to say you need to go through the process again. It's not something we, we just invented, thought about over, overnight. We followed good practice, and this is an example of the process that's followed in Portugal. Um, pretty much the same. You'll see there in Portugal, the minimum requirements, you have to be an engineer and architect with five years of experience. You then have to go and do certain modules, training modules, uh, around data collection and, and, and various other modules. You then have to do training around uh, certification. It then goes to what our, in our case is SUNAS. Um, and then uh, they are, the, the, that particular engineer or architect is given permission to access the central registry and issue the certificate. So pretty much uh, a mirror image of what's been done internationally. I've just added some international, other international examples. Uh, the top left-hand corner is uh, um, the, the certificate that's used in Germany. So instead of A to G, they've got a sliding scale, also from green to red, uh, and pretty much um, uh, gives you an indication, a visual indication quite easily on the, sl on, on the, the slide rule type application. Uh, the, the next one is the one from Spain. Uh, the same as, as we doing in pretty much the European Union standard, excluding one or two countries. Um, the other one is, is uh, from one of the Eastern Bloc countries, and there's Italy and uh, Greece as well. So these are just uh, to give you an indication. Either the, the two on the left-hand side are using a slide rule type approach, the others all using an A to G rating, um, similar to what you see on appliances. So the certificate itself in South Africa um, will give you, you know, details relating to the building itself. Each certificate is uniquely numbered. It will say in terms of the standard that has been uh, issued in terms of what standard. It will give you an indication. You'll see the error there, what your kilowatt hours per square meter per annum is for that building as assessed. In this particular case, 259 kilowatt hours. And then at the, the bottom, it will give you your energy carriers, you know, what areas were used, what time frames were used, what parameters were used. And in this block over here, uh, just below the rating, will have your net floor areas, your building information, your climatic zones, and so on. So all that information will be visual, um, will be in a certificate, will be displayed as you enter the building. So we, we're quite familiar going into hotels when we used to still be allowed to travel and you could see the hotels are three star, four star, five star, and you know what you were letting yourself into. You will now be able to enter a building um, and be able to see straight away where this building um, sits on the scale. 
I mentioned to you that it's aligned to 10400 XA uh, and D being the middle point. 10400 XA has got uh, the same classifications and if we take uh, this, this table and you look at it, um, the specific climatic and the maximum energy consumption, which would give you a D rating under the different climatic zones are listed here. So if you take the top, top one, for example, entertainment and public assembly, climatic zone one, the maximum energy should be 420 kilowatt hours per square meter per annum. If you're doing that um, and achieving that, you'll be a D rated. If you start uh, using more than that, then your rating will drop. Now, what's important to note is um, that if we, we've modeled a couple of these on the new 10400 that is out for, for, for a publication, um, because this, the, the minimum energy consumption figures have improved significantly based on real South African cases and real South African buildings, you will find that if you are a D rating under the current regulation, you will probably only be an F rating on uh, the new 10400. So until that is published, uh, the current EPC will, will remain valid and it will remain valid for five years. But if you only apply for the EPC after the 10400 has been promulgated, um, then your, these targets become a lot more stringent. Um, we've just done a building yesterday that under the current EPC regulations, they be, um, we modeled it on the new 10400 and as they, they dropped right down to an E. So um, it's going to set the ball. The target is, is, is definitely uh, going to be a lot higher. I don't want to go through this whole sheet, but this is typically the data input uh, sheet that we, that we use to, that the basic information you need to be able to, to calculate an EPC and issue key, uh, EPC. Um, gives you, you know, energy uh, consumption in, for heating, cooling, lighting, so you aggregate it or disaggregate it to the different loads. Um, you need to get those figures and then obviously add that up. You need to look at uh, energy exclusion. So lights in the parking areas, outside lights, ventilation, storage excluded, uh, fridge storage is, is excluded. And that needs to be taken into consideration. And then you get to the architectural type information, the net floor area, and then you are able to calculate your energy performance certificate. There are some anomalies, so you might have a building where you uh, have certain areas that are unoccupied at any given time. So it's a three-story building and the first floor is unoccupied, people are not uh, renting it, you've got vacancies. Um, you have to then normalize your calculation for those unoccupied areas. So uh, in, in effect, we're saying you need to look at the effective energy consumption um, and, and, and the occupied net floor area. And so that's one of the anomalies you have to take into consideration when doing the calculation, um, uh, which, which is important. Another one is a mixed occupancy. So you, the four categories or classes of buildings that I've mentioned are, are mandatory, but you might have a different class in the same building. A typical example would be a large workshop area uh, with offices at the end of the workshop area. So you've got a big, big, you know, a warehouse type thing, which warehouses are excluded or workshops are excluded, but offices are mandatory. But the offices happen to be in the same facility. Then you need to look at uh, the percentage occupied of that mandatory class of building. And if it's 10, higher than 10%, then it would require an EPC. If it was less than 10%, then the occupancy, dominant occupancy takes force and you would not require a certificate. So there's all these little uh, fine print things that one has to be aware of when doing an EPC um, that one can look uh, can find in the, in the standards. The register itself, I've gone into, I've already explained that. Um, we uh, mentioned the point that, you know, this will ensure transparency when selling or leasing properties. Um, just to give you an example, we, we, we found last week, I uh, can't mention the names, but it's a, it's a blue chip company that uh, is an international company. It's a multinational company. Uh, they moved into a building, it's a relatively new modern state-of-the-art building. Um, they uh, are very uh, conscious of climate change and they are very aware of the energy footprint and the carbon footprint. So the one of their criteria, there was a lot of criteria, would, was to be in a building that, that was fairly efficient. Um, they now doing the calculation, doing their homework to do an EPC. Um, 
and they uh, are, are renting this building, uh, they're leasing the building. And when they've done their calculations, they found that they are almost four times more than the minimum requirement for a D rating on an EPC. They thought they were moving into this very good building. This was a, a unintended consequence, or let's say an informal audit uh, with the aim of doing the right thing and getting EPC, but now to find out that somewhere along the line, the landlord has slipped up and, and something's not right. So, so they were able to go back to the landlord and say, but these are the facts based on this data, something's gone wrong, or you're charging us too much, or the submetering is not working, or the technologies in the building aren't working. So, so it's, 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 it was a great opportunity for them to uh, go back to the landlord and, and start questioning that. Um, I just included these as of yesterday. I must uh, say that we've got another six uh, EPCs uh, issued today. So they're not included in here. So of the first three that were done, the very first one was Stellenbosch University main admin block. Uh, they took the lead and they, they got the first EPC in South Africa. The second one was a fairly big school, Clutusville Primary School in Clutusville. It's a, a school for previously disadvantaged people. Um, very interesting year what you found because the, the, to do an EPC costs some money. You need to get the sun as accredited body to it. But what happened here is um, a company was awarded a contract to do a lighting upgrade at this particular school. And as they sort of give back their contribution, they said, you've paid us to do this lighting upgrade. We will now pay for the EPC at this building. And they, uh, they that was their contribution or corporate social responsibility. And uh, that was the first school to get to get a rating. Uh, Stellenbosch University admin block got an A rating. Clutusville Primary School got an A rating. And then Kailami, Kailami International Racetrack in Midrand uh, ended up with a B rating. Uh, people ask, now, how can a racetrack be? But, uh, but Kailami International Racetrack is an international convention center as well. Uh, if you look at the building facility, a major conference, lots of offices um, owned by, by, uh, uh, by, by um, uh, Mr. Toby, uh, who has got the rights, the Porsche rights in South Africa, Bugatti, and a couple of other exotic ones. So there's offices, there's conference uh, facilities, and this main facility was, was evaluated and they got a B rating. Okay, so in conclusion, the time is slight. I'd just like to say that uh, EPCs provide a huge opportunity for job creation, um, training and skills development to get people that are in certain disciplines to learn more, get more into the field of data, get into the field of analysis, data analysis. It provides an opportunity for ESCOs to visually see where the business opportunities are uh, it stimulates techno technology adoption like smart options, smart metering to download data to do real-time EPCs. It's contributing to greenhouse gas emission reductions. And uh, the inclusion of other building categories will follow soon, uh, like hospitals, hotels, et cetera, in the next round. But thank you for the opportunity and willing to take questions. Very many thanks for your presentation. Um, just to point out to those attending that uh, you are invited to join the load research chapter and uh, on the holding slide here are, are the uh, contact details um, for uh, during the load research chapter. Otherwise, uh, just contact SAIEE and they'll put you in contact in touch with load research chapter members. Thank you, Barry. Um, I, it was a very interesting presentation. The one of the things that came up was the law of almost unintended consequences. Uh, are you expecting uh, to see some gaming of uh, of the system by the uh, building owners and so on? Yes, definitely. You know, we, we're seeing a lot of buy-in and, and different people are wanting to do it for different reasons. So um, the building owners, the property developers, um, the property in, uh, 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 industry association like SEPOA and so on are really making valuable contributions because they do see this as a valuable tool, uh, a, as a marketing tool for themselves, but also to, to track progress uh, as opposed to be sitting with thousands of electricity bills and so on. So, yes, definitely the buy in is there and um, the, the enthusiasm is there. You know, the numbers of inquiries we're getting, I said we've got another six um, EPCs today. Um, we are aware of many in the pipeline, many, many I'm talking about, you know in the hundreds. Um, so yes, definitely uh, being accepted uh, positively. It's one of the few regulations 
um, that uh, that I've been involved in that have been received positively, even though it actually places an onus on the building owner. Yeah, um, in the electricity planning side, we've seen that uh, it's quite important to understand what the kilowatt hours are, and then you can it gives you an idea of what your maximum demand is, and you can you can carry on from there. So um, this is obviously uh, knowing these figures is is quite useful for electricity planning in general, uh, you know, of, of networks. Um, what are you are you are you perceiving any issues with the compliance of the state with um, with this? Uh, this legislation because the state is a huge uh, owner of building assets in South Africa. The, the, the state is the biggest landlord in the country, owns the most properties. Um, and, and that's what's nice about this regulation. It is applicable to state as well as the private sector. So uh, what we're hoping to see is a bit of a push pull strategy where the private sector pulls the state along and the state leads by example in some cases and pulls the private sector along. So, you know, one won't be a them and us situation. So on the state side, full full buy-in from, from, from public works and infrastructure. Uh, we, we've got a number of programs running. I didn't have time to go into that, um, where we will be rolling out energy efficiency specifically in public buildings. Uh, we're doing a, a number of pilot sites. We're doing a... a 20 public buildings now in the next you know, few weeks. Uh, we've got another program funded by UK PAC where we'll be doing 30 additional buildings, 15 in the private sector, 15 in the public sector, but mainly at municipal level because uh, municipalities also, you know, are, 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 are public funded buildings. So a number of the larger municipalities, um, you work for the city of Cape and they've come to the party with quite a few of their buildings. Luckily, they keep very good records. They've got smart metering almost all their facilities. So, so yeah, we're, we're seeing even-handed um, and, and, and the same approach by public and private and the same level of enthusiasm by both. Okay, thanks, Barry. I'm going to move to questions. Brent here has asked, um, if the building does not have an energy performance certificate, will the building owner be liable for penalties? Penalties are clearly defined in the Act. So you have the Energy Act, which is the foundation uh, legislation. Then you have the regulation, and then you have the standard. Uh, the, the regulation makes provision for uh, or references the Act, which has a clause in it that uh, entitles the Minister of Mineral Resources and Energy to determine a fine payable at the point of time when it is required. So this is still early days. Uh, you know, we, we haven't looked at what that would be. Um, the minister closer to the time will be able to do that. But, uh, you know, in all re reality, I can't see the Minister of Energy imposing a fine on the Minister of Public Works and Infrastructure for not doing that. But there would be uh, have to be good reasons why there's non-compliance. And, and that would be open for public uh, scrutiny. Okay. Another question, uh, which is almost combined between uh, Brent here and Ricardo Nastri. The, the question goes to the efficiencies of power producers. So that's um, the, you know, in the generation side of, uh, of power production uh, in power stations and uh, other plant, um, how, how will this, uh, obviously there's efficiency required there too. How will this impact um, on that side? Because obviously there's a pressure to reduce costs. Yes. So, so at one reflect on the meter, but you're looking at your net energy consumption your kilowatt hours on the, the demand side, not on the supply side. Having said that, uh, we've seen rating systems. There, there's the rating system specifically for power stations and based on the same energy performance on kilowatt hours, and they look more at kilowatt hours consumed as well as generated. So that, that is possible. What we are seeing in industrial applications, uh, as mentioned, is what, what be, uh, strange enough, people have seen this really, as I said, positive, they've accepted positively. So we're seeing people uh, approaching us, uh, hospitals, for example, that are not obliged to do an EPC in terms of the current regulation, some industrial applications, uh, uh, plants, saying we don't have to do it under the current regulation, but we think this is good for our business. We want to see it. We see the value in it. So we will do it on a voluntary basis. So everything outside of those four classes of building can still do and are doing EPCs, but on a voluntary basis purely for their own 
uh, their own internal consumption and also for uh, to help them run their businesses a lot more efficiently in terms of their energy consumption. Yeah, that, uh, in many instances, it just makes good business sense um, because it's defining uh, lean operations. Um, very next question uh, from Greg, Diana. Um, he asks, Barry, an accredited body is required to issue an EPC. However, it cannot do and prepare the data and approve it, question mark. What role will external entities play in assisting clients to compile the data in the correct format? EPC bodies should only verify such data, not compile it. Otherwise, uh, they're, they're both player and referee. Um, also, there's simply not the capacity available. Is What is your view? Okay, so that's a trick question from Greg because <laughs> I know Greg well, and Greg is, he has been doing some work and some good presentations on EPC. So, so nice one, Greg. Nice try, but but yes, uh, but but it's a very interesting point because um, there will never be enough. Uh, if you look at the total building stock, we're talking in the current regulation between two hundred and fifty and three hundred and fifty thousand buildings that uh, would require an EPC. So, the, you know, you need hundreds if not thousands of, of inspection bodies to be able to to meet that demand which which is not going to happen overnight because there's a cost involved of becoming a creditor and, and it's not cheap so we we are at advanced stages and we we've got principal approval that um a lot of this work a lot of the 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 heavy lifting uh will be done by 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 other people so you know as i said uh, you know city of cape town or their building they've got real-time data smart meters they they're really up to date uh some of the big property developers have got 100 percent saturation of smart meters so why would you need to get someone externally pay them to come and tell you what you already know so so that's where we see the job creation component is there will be many many uh, opportunities for people with basic understanding. You need to have a basic understanding of energy, uh, a basic understanding of architecture to be able to gather all this data and collect it and, 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 and analyze it and then go to the SUNAS accredited inspection bodies uh, for final quality control. They'll put it in their model, run it through their model and uh, then sign off on it because in terms of the regulation, they have to issue the, the actual EPC. But yes, uh, Practically, you need thousands of, let's call it for lack of a better word, maybe Marcus and his team can help us with, with the right technology, but data collectors that will then enable the SUNAS inspection bodies to, to run their models and issue the EPC. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have more questions than we have time, Barry. I, I'm going to just pick and choose, but let me... Um, Let's do it this way. If uh, if we miss out on any questions, we can uh, post answer them and lodge them with the presentation, which we will put on the Load Research chapter website at SAIE. Uh, next question from Errol Berman. What is um, sorry from Greg again? What is the typical price of any audit or EPC assessment and issue? Uh, so he's asking about the the cost of the of this admin. Yeah, yeah. So we get asked that question every day, and, and it is one of those. I'm not trying to sidetrack it, but it's virtually impossible. It depends on the size of the building. It depends on what data is available. So if you're going to a one-story building where they've got a smart meter and all the data is available, and they, they've got the plans on hand and digital, digitally available, uh, you know, it could cost literally a couple of hundred rand. Uh, if you go to a 30-story building, which is 10 years old, and no one can find the plans. And uh, you know they've got old analog uh, meters. Um, you need to install loggers and so on. It will cost you a couple of thousand rand. Um, so we put out a, a money tender for uh, a number of buildings to to be assessed. Um, they, they range uh, from anything between five thousand to twenty seven thirty thousand. But it compare it definite. It all uh, uh, is subject to the size of the building and the availability of data. And, and the prices are not regulated. So, so you know, we're trying to create a competitive market by having as many people involved as possible that they can compete against each other and drive the prices down. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I, I'm i just going to skip through because we at roughly seven now uh, on my side. Um, a question from Vazu Chetty. He says, uh, thanks, Barry. Are there guidelines to get buildings more energy efficient? Which is kind of a general question, but 
I, I, I would guess that um, the, uh, the clients are looking for the tools. Yes, uh, fantastic. I mean, it's great. And that's where we move into, uh, you know, in our assessment in building uh, the, the register now, we've done an assessment of all these international uh, uh, cases where they've done it. So the UK example, for example, they do an EPC uh, and give you an audit report at the same time. So you'll get an EPC and it'll say, let's say, for example, you see, and it will say for you to become a, to get to a B rating, you need to do this, 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 change the lights, change the, clean the filters in your HVAC, et cetera. Uh, if you want to get to an A, you need to do this, 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 plus this, uh, specifically specifying the technologies um, that you need to do to improve the, we're not there yet. That's what we want to do. That is our intention, our objective. Um, as we work, as we're developing and as we're learning, we're building some case studies and we will get to that point. The guidelines on how EPCs will work, uh, we finished that. It's now with uh, just with the, 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 the creative people to put some graphics in that. So it will give you the overall process and how to and what to look for and what not to look for, the data and so on. But the, the actual improvements, how to improve from one level to another, um, that will be something that is definitely uh, in the making. And, and that's something that's critically important because, you know, for the building owner to say, well, you're derating, you know, so what? Um, you know what, what? What can I do? You need you need to take the next step because the certificate itself is not going to save you any kilowatt hours. It's a certificate telling you how good or bad you are. You need to take a step to improve, and and you we need to provide that guidance uh, to assist the person who's you know potentially not technical, uh, but wants to do the right thing. So very very good point. Okay, uh, Barry, just a very very last question. Um, I. And it's been asked two times now. The the question is this about uh, renewable energy sources uh, installed into these buildings. What is the relationship between the energy provided with these uh, renewable systems and the energy certificates? Is it netted of it or is it um, uh, ignored, the supplementary uh, yeah. renewable yeah. energy? Okay. Okay. Um, so when the standard was written in 2014, you know, uh, small-scale embedded generation was was a pipe dream. Now it's a, a real reality. So it, it's not clearly defined in the, the the standard or the regulations. It will be in the revised standard. But yes, uh, the, the the short answer is it is is subtracted the energy from renewable sources. So it reduces your kilowatt hours per square meter from grid. And it does improve your performance rating. So it does it is factored in, but the you know the the actual uh, revised standard will have a, a clear direction on how to do this. But uh, we you know you can't be penalizing people for doing the right thing and going for the for the for the small scale embedded generation is obviously the right thing to do, and people should be rewarded or acknowledged for that through their through their their certificate. Okay, Barry. Uh now, this is a mercy question. Um, it's been specially asked for me to ask. Our friend uh, Paseka from Mabena from uh, CSR has asked how one qualifies to become a building assessor for EPC. Okay, yeah. No, it was a good question. So, Sanas has specific requirements. You need to do certain things, you need to have certain capacity, qualifications, uh, ISO filing systems. Uh, it is on our website. There's a three-page SANAS document of what the requirements are. Um, it, it's, it's pretty straightforward right now because we don't have any uh, SACWA-approved training courses. So, you know, in some of the other accreditation areas, you need to have done specific courses. The Portuguese case, I show you, you have to have a five-year qualification in engineering or architecture. We don't have that. Uh, they do expect you to have some basic skills. That's all highlighted in a document. Uh, on, on our website. So uh, please feel free to do that. And as you said, if you can't get through all the questions, I mean, we, that's, that's our job. That's what we paid for, to answer the questions. We don't necessarily always have the answers, but we know the people who do have the answers. So, you know, at any given time, people can send the questions through 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 yourselves uh, or go to our website. Um, uh, we prepared to and, and willing and would like to learn from others as well um, uh, e e through the questioning process. Okay, uh, Barry, thank you very much uh, for your comprehensive uh, response to these questions. And uh, uh, thank you, colleagues, for, for um, joining us uh, 
to to witness uh, this development, I think it's going to yield very uh, positive results uh, in the energy consumption industry. Uh, Barry, once again, from my side and from the load research chapter side, uh, thank you very much for for giving us this information from Senedi's side, and uh, we hope to see you and your colleagues in future. Thank you very much for the opportunity, and really looking forward to working with your chapter and and the 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 the, the whole SAIEE um, industry, because you are the guys and the experts that will be able to make this happen. So thank you very much once again, and and wishing you all well and a good evening. Very much uh, from the same side, from our side, and um, thank you to colleagues. We bid you good night.